Okay, we are live. Uh, hello and welcome. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a different video today. Um, I've kind of had to <laughs> work with my microphone and try to get this working, but uh, we are going to do a bit of a different video today. And this one actually comes at the request of one of the users on the forum where I post uh, my games. Uh, and uh, she had been asking uh, how I create certain dungeons and especially certain mazes. Um, and she kind of referenced uh, some of the forest uh, maps that I've done in some of my previous games. And so I wanted to, I'm actually going to put out a series of videos. I'm going to start with this one, um, just going over different mapping techniques and some of the things that I've, that I've learned, some of the things that I've done. And uh, this episode is actually just going to be um, talking about how to create realistic maps with somewhat more detailed floor plans in the editor. Uh, and it's not the end result's not going to be amazing. It's just going to be kind of a basic standard map, but it should give you an idea of some of the techniques you can use and some of the trips, uh, tricks you can use uh, when creating maps. Um, and then later in the week, I'm actually going to upload some videos um, talking about parallax mapping, uh, you know, what it is, how I got started with it, uh, how I make some of the maps. And I, I'm actually going to upload a couple videos uh, going step by step into the creation of an actual uh, map that will be used in uh, my newest game that I'm making, Thrall. Um, but today we're just going to focus on the editor. Uh, I'm just using the RTP. I am not using any custom tiles for this. Uh, and it, it, the idea is that this is going to be kind of like a beginner map. It's not going to be, um, you know, super high quality or anything like that. But it it should serve its purpose. Um, so one of the first things that I do when I'm creating a new map, I usually start with a 50 by 50 uh, map size. And what I'll usually do, uh, this may be a little bit of a controversial opinion. But I don't think that the random dungeon generator that comes with the engine is bad. Um, I think that it's a good first step. I don't know if you can hear that. That is my clock. Please ignore that. There's a chiming going on in the background. Um, I don't think that the random, random dungeon generator is bad. Uh, I, I, I do think that it's not enough. It, it's a good first step, but it's not enough to just make your dungeons as is. But what I'm going to kind of demonstrate is how, although it can be, you know, a little boring at first, it's actually not bad for generating floor plan. This is a little boring, but we can kind of cycle through a couple different iterations. That's a little much. Uh, let's go with... Uh, that's okay. Let's go with something a little bit winding. Let's see here. Eh, not bad, not bad. That's okay, but that one room in the top's a little big, so let's kind of go through a couple more here. The thing is, because it's completely random, you, you don't... One of the things that always trips me up when I'm making a dungeon is, uh, before I kind of settled on this technique, was determining a floor plan. I always found it to be so tedious. See, this actually looks okay, but when you look at it, it's actually one straight shot. There's no branching paths, which we could alter that, but we're just going to kind of go with something a little bit more diverse, but not too complex. This looks okay. Yeah, this looks okay. So we're going to go with this. As a floor plan for a dungeon, this actually isn't that bad. As a dungeon on its own, it's pretty bad. Um, everything looks the same, you're just going to get lost, all the paths between them are only one tile wide. Um, you know, this is not enough, but it's a good start. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to do a forest dungeon. So I'm going to do a dirt path. And I'm going to replace all the walls and ceiling tiles with grass. There we go. Okay. So here's our baseline. This is what we're going to be working on, uh, working with for the time being. So this is okay, but it's 
we're, we're talking about a forest. We're talking about something that's natural generation. It's not man-made. So we need to rough this up a little bit. We need to make it a little bit more random. And the first thing we're going to do is they're actually going to erase some of the paths between the rooms or sections, whatever you want to call them. And we're just going to kind of redraw them with a little bit more, kind of a little bit more randomness, a little bit more gaps between them. And this will kind of be a rough outline of how the maps are going to be connected, but it's not going to be, yeah, it's not like a hard boundary or anything, but it just kind of gives you an idea of like, oh, okay, I can go that way. So we're just going to kind of do these little dirt tile paths. Oh, that's a little. There we go. You don't want to spend too much time focusing on this because it's the idea is that it is random. You don't want it to be carefully constructed and, you know, it, it's not meant to be perfect. So with this, that's not bad. I'm trying not to use hotkeys if I can, because I may accidentally press the one that stops the recording. <laughs> I've done that once already and I had to restart. So we're gonna try to just keep this with mouse clicks instead. Here we go, okay. All right, so that's not bad. Our, yeah, it's, a, it's a little rough, but you know, it, uh, it kind of indicates to the player where they can and cannot go, uh, but all these, rooms or sections or clearings, whatever you want to call them, are perfectly square. And that doesn't happen in forests. So we're going to rough up the edges a little bit. I'm just going to kind of knock out some of the corners. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just enough to kind of give it the feel of a more natural foresty kind of look. And the thing is, it doesn't matter how small the clearings become because this isn't our hard border. This is a, um, this is a guideline. And I'll kind of explain what I mean there in a, in a minute here. But one of the things that does take some time to learn how to do, but if you can learn how to do it, uh, it it's it'll really help your mapping technique. Is um, teaching players what they can and cannot do, where they can and cannot go. Uh, and one of the games that does that very well is Pokemon, because they. Uh, I, I especially like to refer to the uh, some of the older generations like Gen 3, uh, Ruby, Emerald, Sapphires, that there's a very hard border around the map where it's like it's very clear to the player you can go here, you cannot go here. It's very distinct. Um, but what those games do very well is they they have that limitation without it feeling limited. Uh, it, it still gives the illusion of a, a vast open world that you're traveling through, not like closed, isolated rooms, while still making it very clear to the player what is part of the actual path and what is not. And if you can learn to do that with your mapping technique while still keeping your maps intricate and interesting, uh, you're going to do very well. So here's our basic floor plan. It's a little bit more natural. Um, but you know what, it's it's still kind of boring. So we're gonna add a little bit extra here. We're actually gonna do some tall grass and this will kind of be a little bit more identifying the hard border of the map. So what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna go about two or three tiles out from the clearing. We're just gonna kind of draw this in. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're, we're drawing a border, but we're not, it's not, um, it's not meant to be. Yeah, there we go. Okay, that's not bad. Uh, we'll probably add some like clearings and stuff in the grass because it's not going to be perfectly symmetrical all the time. It's not like, oh, you go off the path and then suddenly everything's overgrown. Like there are places where 
you know, he'd look under a tree and there's nothing growing there because it hasn't seen any sunlight because the tree's so massive and, you know, maybe and some animals have made their dens or whatever. It's it's not like you go off the path and suddenly it's just tall grass all the time everywhere. So we're going to add a little bit of clearing. That's good. Um, we'll add a little bit more of this to the detail of the map in a minute here. But for now, we're actually going to set up our border for the map. And in this case, um, I don't have a lot of resources to work with. I just have these tree tiles, so I'm going to go with them. It'll have to do. And uh, I could just do the bucket tool and do that. That's not fun. So we're actually going to go the pencil tool and we're just going to kind of lightly trace the border we just drew. And these are essentially going to be the walls of our dungeon. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can kind of cut into the short grass a little bit. Um, the main thing, oh no. The main thing you don't want is you don't want it to cut into the path, but that's, we won't do that. There we go. And now we actually will bucket fill that, but at the same time we are going to just kind of around these clearings that we've already drawn out, we're going to remove a couple of the tree tiles. Oh, no, don't want to do that. We don't want to make it so that the player thinks they can cut through that. That's not going to work. There we go. This map shouldn't take us too long to do. Maybe like 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, it's not going to be incredible by the time it's done, but it'll it sh it should be okay. Um, and in case you're wondering, this is actually kind of the mapping style that I use, some of the mapping technique that I use when I'm making maps in my own games. It's just I, I typically use parallax mapping more than um, in editor. And I'll just kind of give you an example here. Uh, let me open up a map uh, on the game I'm working on now, Thrall. So this is one of the forest maps that I've just finished, I think, yesterday. Um, and this is obviously parallax mapping, but the technique used to make this map is essentially the same as this. It's just that I have a lot more control and flexibility because I'm not focused on using the editor. I'm using an image editor. Uh, I use GIMP. Um, I find it to be powerful enough to do everything I need it to do without it being, uh, yeah, without having to spend hundreds of dollars on the software. So, but anyway, that's kind of like our basic hard border for the map. Let's just kind of add in the trunks and the tops of these trees. I'm actually going to do it that way instead. There we go. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, so we're just going to add the tops and bottoms into these trees. And while we're doing that, let's just... One of the things I do want to kind of mention is that having good maps will not make a good game. I oftentimes see community members that say, if only my maps were better, my game would be more popular. Or if only I was better at graphic design, I would, uh, you know, my game would be better. And to that I say not necessarily. Um, good graphics don't necessarily make a good game. At the same time, bad graphics don't necessarily make a good game either, but what I have personally found, and you can disagree with this if you want, it doesn't really matter, but, what I have found is that if your game is good, if it has good mechanics, good storytelling, good pacing, um, I'm more willing to overlook poor graphics or, or poor mapping. Um, and just kind of as, as an example, I still to this day love playing some of the classic NES and uh, N64 games that nowadays are pretty dated and it's very obvious <laughs> you know it's not exactly pretty anymore at the time it was groundbreaking and revolutionary but nowadays it's you know 
it's kind of ugly, but you know what? The game is good. The game still holds up because the storytelling is great. The pacing is great. The, the mechanics are phenomenal. The puzzles are great. So if you have a good game, then it, I, I don't want to say your mapping and your graphics don't matter, but they don't matter as much as you think they do. And more to the point, just because you have good graphics does not mean you have a good game. If you think that good graphics and good mapping is going to improve your game, I personally think that's a little bit flawed thinking. Work on how your game plays and feels first before you try putting a fresh coat of paint on. Because that's really all it is. You know, good maps are really nothing more than a nice coat of paint. But if this if the foundation is shaky, if the if the bones aren't very good, um, then it doesn't matter how good it looks. It's not going to be fun to play. So don't think that you need to be an incredible mapper or have amazing graphics to have a popular game or a good game. Uh, work on what's fun. Work on what you actually enjoy about making your game. And don't worry so much about what people think about how it looks. Um, if people like your game, they'll play it. Uh, and you know, you can make good maps with just the RTP. You don't need custom graphics. You don't need custom resources. But anyway, okay, uh, we've pretty much set out a hard border for this map now. Um, now what we could do is all these kind of places in between where the walls used to be, we could just put trees in there, but we want to have some distinguishing features of this map that make it so that the player knows where they are pretty much at any given time. So what we're going to do, we're actually going to add a little pond. And so we're going to kind of just fill in this little section. That should be good. There we go. Nothing fancy, just a nice, simple little pond. And uh, yeah, there. Now we have like a kind of a landmark that players can use so that they don't get lost. If they're in any one of these three clearings and they're on the edge of this pond, they will immediately know where they are in the map. And that's the big thing. Mazes are, yeah, maze... in a maze, you're kind of meant to get lost, but, oh, I missed one here. Um, but most players don't like trying to grind through finding the right path on a maze. They like to at least know where they are at in the map. Uh, and that's kind of what the purpose of this is, is trying to create a map that even though, oh, you know what, I should have copied the, here, I'll just do this. Oh, no, not that big. Even though this is essentially what we started with, yeah, a player would very easily get lost in here because everything looks the same. This is essentially the same map, but it's a lot easier to see where you are and, and a lot easier to navigate. Uh, but we're not done with this. This is still just um, kind of the first couple steps. Now we are actually going to add a little bit more uh, obstacles so that the player can't just, you know, cut across. Um, still needs to be a map that has some navigation required. It is a forest after all. And that's another thing. I've had, like, for example, in a map like this, people say like, oh yeah, but trees don't grow that close together. You could be, like, you could just walk between trees. Like, why, why should that stop you? Have you ever actually seen a forest? Like a legit forest? Like not one that's your park in New York, but like an actual overgrown forest that's not maintained by gardeners. Trees grow so densely that you can't even see through them, let alone walk. You know, this is not unrealistic as far as, you know, how dense of a forest this actually is. Um, and same thing with this. Like, although, yes, these trees are kind of weird blobby block things. Um, yeah, trees can grow so close together that you can't walk between them. So don't think it's unrealistic. And even if it isn't, who cares? It's a game. It's your game. You can do with it what you want. Um, anyway, okay, so this is not bad, uh, but we do need to add a little bit more decoration to this. Uh, so what we're gonna do, let's, let's add a little bit more. Actually, no, the grasses, I think. Uh, well, hold on, let's 
add a little bit of grass into the kind of center clearings. I should have added some in here, but that's okay. There we go. So now what we're actually gonna do, we're gonna add a little bit more decoration to the map. And how I typically do that, I have a set of resources that I use, um, like these little rocks and flowers and things like that. Um, that when I'm in, in in an image editor, I keep a, a file, like a, a layer group of every resource that I have, one of each, and then I copy the group and I move one layer in at a time uh, so that I don't have the same tiles uh, in the same spot in the map, uh, but it still adds that kind of feeling of being an overgrown forest. In the editor, I just kind of take a look at what I've got. So I've got these 10 tiles here that I could use. These are more like crops, so I'm not going to use those. I could use these mushrooms and the dirt pile there, um, maybe these leaves and these lily pads. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to start with one, and I'm going to kind of place them, not necessarily in every section of the map, but the main thing is I don't want to have two side by side kind of like that, because it's, oh, whoops, because then it, it's very clear like, oh, yeah, that's the same tile. Um, but if you kind of space them out throughout the map, it looks a little bit more natural, a little bit more random. And then we're going to move on to the next one. We'll just go, let's see, one, two, yeah, we'll skip that one, three, place one there. Good, yeah. And again, don't overthink it. It's just, a, you know, it's not meant to be super complicated or, or, or perfect. It's It's a forest. So we're just going to kind of scatter these about around a bit. Oh, I, uh, I kind of skipped a step. Um, I added trees into this one section and then I didn't add them to the others. So I'm going to stop that for a second. We're just going to add in a couple more groves here because we need to have some collision, basically. I'll actually just extend that right down to the tree line there. Uh, and then this one here will kind of have come up like that. I think that's good. Let me take a look there. Yeah, I think that kind of blocks off all the paths that we're trying to block off the player. So there we go. Okay. Yeah, I skipped a step. I jumped the gun and started decorating the map before I actually added all the collision I needed. So we will fix that. I think that's good. Okay. I'm sure I've missed one. I'll correct it. That's good. Yeah, I think that's that's good. That's what we needed to be. Perfect. Okay. Um, I don't think I overwrote any of the tiles that I had there, but even if I did, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, and we're just going to kind of keep decorating the map here. We'll throw in some weeds and flowers and things like that. And the thing is, like, yes, this, this is a very open kind of transition between these two sections. It's not like it's a, um, like a really narrow path. You don't necessarily want a narrow path, though. Uh, because for one, you want to make sure that the player knows where they can go. You need to be able to communicate that well to your player. But also you want to make sure that um, it works for whatever map and whatever game you're making. So for example, um, if you're using random encounters, it doesn't matter how wide or narrow your paths are because every step could potentially lead to an encounter. Um, but if you're using something like touch encounters, where the enemies are actually on the map and they'll kind of chase you or whatever, narrow paths can be fine if that's what you're going for in the game is, you know, touch encounters that are essentially unavoidable. Um, but if you want to be able to dodge them, you want it to be wide open so that you have that room to navigate. You may, maybe you don't want it to be as open as this, uh, but you don't necessarily want it to be super restrictive either because then it's it's just going to be frustrating for the player it's like well what's the point of having touch encounters if you can't avoid them that's just my opinion but yeah so 
We're just going to kind of, these are a little bit large and obtrusive, so I'm not going to place too many of them. All right, now these stumps, you're likely to find quite a few of these in a forest, so I'm going to be a little bit more liberal with those. Not that one there, though. I'll just kind of place them in places that I think would make sense. You're actually likely to find more stumps near the edges of a clearing than you would uh, otherwise, because that's why it's called a clearing. You've cleared away the trees. Place this log there. Some of these kind of fallen logs, you're going to find a lot of those probably closer to the edge of the tree line. And these little dirt patches, we can have those actually be on the soil. Give a little bit more character. There we go. And mushrooms, you know, let's play some mushrooms. Like, I like, I like placing mushrooms in places where they're kind of hidden. You know, they're, they're tucked away behind a little tree or something. They're not, um, they're not right out in the open because mushrooms grow better in darkness. So I, I figure like mushrooms fit better in like the shade of a tree or something like that. And let's go with some leaves. You can have some leaves kind of floating in the water. This is getting a little bit too cluttered. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm not great at making maps in the editor, just because it is a fairly limited uh, platform. But that's okay. It doesn't, uh, like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is just kind of a sample map to show different mapping technique. Um, but honestly, that's actually kind of good. That's that's not bad. We're we're looking okay here. Uh, just for perspective, this is where we started, and this is where we're at now. Um, so using the random dungeon generator to kind of figure out your floor plan is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you just don't want to stop there. Uh, now, we do need to figure out where the entrance and exit to this map is. In Thrall, the player generate like just spawns in the middle of the map, and there's like one of four exits that the player can will basically have to find. It's, it's randomly placed. Um, that works well for a game like this, where I don't need to have a hard exit actually worked into the map. I can have it evented. But for something like this, maybe you're going with more of a classic RPG where you're trying to go from one end to the other and kind of navigate your way through. In which case, maybe what we could do is we'll have an exit up here. There. And we'll, whoops. Just kind of do it like that. There, so that's where the player comes in, but we want to make sure they know they, where they're going, so we're going to add a bit of a path. And then we'll go in the opposite corner. I'll say like that. There, and now that's where the player ent enters or exits, and that's the other side. Um, so this map's actually pretty much done. There's not really much else to do with this. Um, Again, it's not great, but it works. I'll just kind of navigate this. Now, the point with this is that oh, that music is awful. Although we started with the random dungeon generator, we have a basic floor plan. It's like this is one room. This is another room. But because of what we've done, like placing this pond here, for example, we've added landmarks and places where the player can navigate from so they don't get lost. And we've kind of taken what's what was a very rigid and uh, uniform structure and kind of roughed it up a bit. It made it look more like natural generation. It's a little bit cluttered, I'm not going to lie. I don't exactly care for this uh, overall look. But you know what? It works. 
and and that's really what you're going for. You're not necessarily trying to have the yeah, like like I said earlier, it, it how good your mapping is is not nearly as important as how fun your game is. So I mean, if this works and this is all you need, great. Most players will look at this and think, "Yep, this is fine." Uh, I'm. I will say that you know what? If I played a game that was maybe somebody's first, first or second game, like maybe they'd only been making games for a couple of years, or and and they were still kind of learning the different techniques, and I saw this as like one of maybe five or six maps in like a forest dungeon, I, I wouldn't be terribly impressed, but I wouldn't be unimpressed. You know, I would think, okay, you know, they've got a general idea of what they're doing. Um, so yeah, like it's it's fairly easy to figure out where you are. It's fairly easy to navigate. It's not you're you're not likely to get too lost. Um, and I mean, there's more we can do with this too. Like if we wanted to, we could add like a cliff face. Um, the tiles for this are awful, so I'm not gonna do too much with this. But we could add like a you know little cliff face that kind of adjusts how the map. Just traversed, make it just a little bit more, you know, add a little bit more flavor to it, a little bit more character. Um, honestly, that look, looks kind of terrible, but it's, you know, it, it works. You know, maybe it's not great for this map. That would have been better to implement early on before we started adding all the trees and stuff, but, you know, it works. That's just an example, but yeah. So, I mean, that's just a few things you can kind of keep in mind when you're working on maps in the editor. Um, obviously, yeah, using custom tiles will uh, give it a little bit more of a unique flavor to it. Um, you know, you probably don't want to have this much clutter on this map. This is a little excessive, um, but you know what? That's just it. It's It's not necessarily about it's better to just start and put something together and then test it and see how it works. Because if you do that, you'll you'll get a feel for, you know, is this too open? Do I need to cinch it up a bit and maybe bit, make it a bit more restrictive? Is it, uh, you know, a little bit hard to navigate? Do I may, maybe want to add a little bit more bodies of water to make it a little bit easier? Um, you know, do I maybe want to even close off some paths altogether so that it's a little bit more maze-like? You know, you'll figure that out as you test the game. Um, but overthinking your map design before you even jump into mapping is probably the biggest thing that will slow you down. I know that that's probably one of the biggest reasons why I procrastinated in my, in my game development is that I I start overthinking things. And more often than not, you just need to jump in and do it and put together you know, a minimum viable product so that when you come back, you can tweak it and you can work on it. Um, I mean, this took us, what, half an hour? Most of the maps that I typically make for Thrall, like this took, I think, two and a half to three hours. Um, if you look at some of the maps in the Bloodstone Mine, these are actually very, uh, these are, much more rigid to the structure of the random dungeon generation. Um, but again, this took about two hours as an example. Um, but you know, it's still fairly detailed. It's still fairly easy to navigate. Um, and you know, it works. Again, these are all custom tiles and it was done with parallax mapping in an image editor. Um, but if I got so bogged down in thinking, how do I want the layout of this map to look before I even started mapping it, I would never have started. You just got to start, you know, and use the random dungeon generator if you need to, uh, to just generate a floor plan and then work around that. You know, obviously don't end with that. You want to tweak it. You don't want to just do this and then be like, there's my dungeon. That's not going to be fun. It's not going to be good. Nobody's going to like this because they will get lost, but you can take this and turn it into this. And you know what? It serves the same purpose. And that's really what it's about. Is is what your map, is the map you're creating serving the purpose you're trying to accomplish? 
is it is it meeting your needs if it's not revamp it work on it and if it is don't overthink it don't try to perfect it you know it's you will get better and better the more maps you create you will not get better by trying to perfect one map i didn't get to this kind of parallax mapping style overnight it took a solid year of redoing all the maps in bloodstained hands where literally the very first map that i made with parallax mapping in bloodstained hands was cyana and this took about eight hours now this would take me probably about two but this first map the first time i ever started parallax mapping took eight hours when I was doing the Saley Forest, this took, I think, yeah, a full day. This took, I think, another eight hours. But I was still learning, right? I was still learning the technique. Um, obviously, it looks better in game than it does in the editor. But you know, you just gotta just start. Don't overthink it. And eventually, you'll get to a point where you you've done enough maps and you've got enough practice where you don't have to overthink it anymore, and you can just go. It's going to be a slow process at first, but you know what? If you even if you just start with something like this, and it takes you, this took about half an hour for me to make. If it takes you an hour to two, that's okay. You know, we're all just learning, right? So, anyway, that's it for this episode. Um, I am going to release some more episodes later, either this week or next, uh, detailing parallax mapping, uh, how I got started with that, and um, you know what. To, what it actually looks like to make a map. I'm actually going to do a step-by-step -step of how to make a full parallax mapped forest like the one I showed you earlier. So with that, have a great day and see you soon.